Hi, and welcome back to Focal Point on AFR Talk. Great to have you with us on board the USS Focal Point, which is a patrol boat, not a pleasure cruise, searching relentlessly for the intersection of truth and politics. Our commander is on the bridge. The scriptures serve as our map or our nautical charts for the sea going among us. Holy Spirit, our navigator, and I serve as your loyal, humble, and cheerful uh, first mate. Uh, shifting gears just a little bit from a uh, naval analogy to real Army life, I'm honored and pleased to welcome to our decision maker line retired Lieutenant General Jerry Boykin, who is now serving as Executive Vice President of the Family Research Council in Washington, D.C. Uh, General Boykin was one of the original members of the United States Army's Delta Force, commanded elite warriors in combat operations and commanded for a time all of the Green Berets in the Army, as well as the Special Warfare Center and School. Last four years in the Army were spent in Washington, D.C. as the U.S. Deputy Undersecretary of Defense for Intelligence. General Boykin, welcome back to Focal Point with Brian Fisher. Hey, Brian, it's uh, it's just great to be with you. Well, it's terrific to have you with us, Uh, General. I always appreciate what you bring to the program, and in particular, I wanted to chat with you for a few minutes. We're coming up on the anniversary of 9-11 tomorrow, obviously, and you as work you've done, intelligence operations for the military, uh, work you've done with the Delta Force and the Green Berets. You are uh, certainly uh, conversant with the whole uh, issue of the threat of radical Islam, and I wanted to chat with you a little bit about where you think uh, things stand, and maybe the place I'd like to begin, General Boykin, do you think that our leadership gets it when it comes to the threat that Islam poses to the West and to the United States of America? Do you think our political leadership right now gets it? Uh, I can answer that very shortly. Uh, No, they clearly (laughs) do not. And it's, uh, it's very disturbing to me, Brian, uh, this is, uh, this is almost criminal. Uh, you know, you have, there's actually a federal statute that it says if you know of a threat and you ignore that threat or you don't deal with that threat, you can actually be held, uh, you know, criminally liable. And I think that's what we're seeing today in that, you know, everybody's focused on terrorism and, uh, you know, violent extremism, uh, suicide bombings and assassinations and blowing up buildings. But the reality is the stealth jihad that is executed by the Muslim Brotherhood in America today is far more dangerous than down the Twin Towers. Uh, It, in the long term, will have an absolutely devastating impact on our society and our culture and our legal system. Let me ask you just for a quick read. I don't know if you had a chance to look into this, but I've got a story in the stack here somewhere, not right in front of me where we have turned over a detention facility at Bagram Air Force Base in Afghanistan with 3,082 Muslim militants in it. We've turned that over to the Afghani government. Is that a good move, or is that a risky move? Well, uh, I think, first of all, it's inevitable that we're going to have to turn those people over to them. Uh, I do think it's premature, and secondly, um, I think we should expect that many of those are going to be back out in the countryside, are going to continue to fight uh, against Karzai's government, and will continue to uh, have a deep passion for wanting to destroy America and Western democracy. Now, do you, uh, and and again, this is not something I'd anticipate chatting with you about, but I just want to kind of get your take, uh, and I realize you're not speaking for anyone but for yourself on this, but I'm looking at our mission in Afghanistan, and I think a lot of people, General Boykin, are kind of wondering why exactly are we there. It seems like the nation-building effort here uh, on the part of the United States is, isn't is going that well. That our, It's always seemed to me that our mission there ought to be purely military. We've got an enemy that's out to destroy us. Let's go in there. Let's neutralize them. And then when the job is done, when we've neutralized the threat, uh, then it's time to bring uh, our troops home. And I've wondered if maybe the mission there now in Afghanistan primarily calls for uh, special operations type uh, forces rather than having a very strong military presence. But I don't know if that's a naive way of looking at that or not. Well, I think, you know, first of all, let's go back on the history there. We actually had completed our stated mission by December of 2001 in that we had driven the uh, Taliban and al-Qaeda out of power 
uh, the most of Al Qaeda had gone back across the border, and the Taliban uh, had gone underground or back into Pakistan as well. Then we lost our focus. We had good momentum going. We decided we were going to create a uh, a democratic representative government there, and uh, we went to work on that. And then we lost our focus in 2003 when we went into Iraq. Uh, and when we went into Iraq, we turned Afghanistan over to NATO, and that was when the Taliban, as well as al-Qaeda, began to resurge, began to take back the countryside and uh, entrench themselves in such a way that it's been very difficult to get them out. So uh, to answer your question, I think that we completed the mission, hmm. and then we, uh, we stayed on. Uh, and I am uh, one of those Americans who believes that it is uh, we're coming up on a point where we need to say we've done all we can do here. We've given them a chance. They can accept it or reject it. What they do with it is up to them. But you cannot rebuild that country uh, in the span of uh, a decade. Uh, you're talking about one of the most primitive places in the world uh, and a tribal area that you know, owes their allegiance only to the tribal leadership, and I personally believe that it is time for us to say we've done all we can do for you. Now you're on your own. And by the way, if uh, if there's another attack from here, you know you've got to understand we're going to make a parking lot out of part mm -hmm. of this country here. Yeah, we'll be back. Yeah, and that, and and I that's what I've always felt, uh, General. I uh, you know uh, pleased to hear you say that that our jobs go in there and neutralize the threat, and then say to the Afghani people, look, if you don't want us to come back and sort of bomb you back to the Stone Age and don't let anybody replace whom we've just taken out with anybody that'll make the same kind of threat against the United States. And uh, General Boykin, one other question on this. You know, we've tried to do nation building, tried to build a democracy in Iraq. We've tried to build one in Afghanistan. Do you think it is possible to do nation building, uh, building a democratic form of government or a democratic nation in a Muslim country? Is that even possible? No, when you start with the Quran as the Constitution, uh, like in Saudi Arabia, like in Iran, when you start with the Quran as the Constitution, you bring Sharia. That's Islamic law. One of the first tenets of that is there can be no man-made laws. That's incompatible with democracy. We were foolish to think that we could build a true representative government there. And when we started writing that Constitution with the words, Islamic Republic. It's, it's incompatible. It doesn't work. Now let's talk for the last several minutes about what we need to do here in America. We've obviously had the 9-11 attack happened. We've thwarted several dozen attacks that are designed against military installations and other targets, the U.S. Capitol, the Pentagon, in, in the intervening 11 years. Uh, uh, General Boykin, what do you think we need to do right now to protect the United States from further attacks from Muslims? Yeah, uh, first of all, we need to seal the borders of America. And uh, very few people know how porous those borders are, and uh, the experts will tell you that there are some nefarious things coming across our borders, particularly our southern border. Uh, and we know that there are terrorist cells that have come across. We don't know what they've brought with them, but they've come across our borders. So seal the borders. Secondly, demand that the uh, leadership of this country face up to what we're up against. When uh, last summer we did a study with the Center for Security Policy uh, and discovered that in 50 court cases in America, in 23 states, judges admitted they were using Sharia to adjudicate those cases. Now, that's a violation of Article 6 of our Constitution. So we need to demand that the leadership face up to the realities of the encroachment of Sharia. The next thing we need to do is we need to go to the Muslim community in America, and we need to encourage them and say, if you reject Sharia, if you want Sharia in America, come along beside us or we'll come along beside you. We'll work with you. We'll, we'll do all we can, stand up and become a voice for the for the Muslims in America that reject that kind of legal system and uh, stand with them. But uh, today, the only voice for them is actually the Muslim Brotherhood. They mm. speak for all Muslims in America. And, that's, you know, it's also a fact that there are 
more Muslims that reject Sharia than those who want Sharia. We need to come along beside them. But we've got to demand that the leadership in this country stand up uh, and tell us the truth about what's happening here and quit trying to appease the front front groups for the Muslim Brotherhood like CARE and ISNA and, and a variety of others. Now, uh, General Boykin, do you have any reservations about Muslims with their allegiance to the Quran and to Allah serving in the United States military? Well, I have a, I have a lot of reservations about it as a result of Nadal Hassan and uh, two or three others that have taken an oath to our Constitution only to uh, either perpetrate or plan terrorist acts and then say, uh, my allegiance is to the Quran, it's not to the Constitution, even though they took an oath. Yes, I have a great concern about it. I believe there are many Muslims who can truthfully take an oath to the Constitution and will fulfill that oath. But there are others, uh, as demonstrated by Hassan and those that I spoke about, that it's all a ruse. It's all under the heading of takia, which is lying to protect or further the faith. Uh, they are a real threat, and I, I don't know what the acid test for those people would be, but there's got to be some way that we can sort that out before we allow them to serve in our military and take that oath, because to me it's a sacred, solemn oath. One last question about religious liberty, General Boykin. I think you've had some observations about you, you think it's possible that Islam should not be allowed to claim religious liberty rights in America for a particular reason. Can you elaborate on that? Well, that's right. Uh, when practiced in an authoritative way, when a, when a Muslim is adhering to the dictates of the Quran and the Hadith, Islam is not just a religion, it's a totalitarian way of life. And they say the same thing. It's not just Jerry Boykin saying this. They say the same thing. It's totalitarian, including a legal system, a government system, a military system, a geopolitical system. And that is not protected. Now, there are many Muslims that don't adhere to the strict dictates of the Quran. They must be allowed to worship. General Boykin has been our guest, Lieutenant General Jerry Boykin, the Executive Vice President now at the Family Research Council, one of the original uh, Delta Force members. Thank you, General, for being with us. Look forward to seeing you in D.C. this weekend for the Values Voter Summit. Thanks for taking time to be with us, and God bless you. God bless you, Brian. Lieutenant General retired Jerry Boykin, back with more. Stay with us, Focal Point AFR Talk. <laughs> 